Now let's everybody get our Bibles and let's turn to uh, John chapter uh, 6 and uh, let's read about 18 verses here. It's John chapter 6 verses 22 through 40. So it's John chapter 6 verses 22 through 40. So let's get our Bibles and let's pick it up over there, um, the Word of God. And this is a time of worshiping the Lord when we honor the Lord by reading the Word of God. I believe that's very important. Uh, John chapter 6, verses 22 through 40. Let's everybody join in as we read the Word of God together. Uh, the day following, when the people stood on the other side of the sea, Amen. Uh, you may be seated. And uh, what we have here in John chapter 6, we picked it up. Actually, we start it in the book of Exodus, but uh, we find that the word manna is used three times here in this chapter. So we're looking at the New Testament uh, teaching about uh, manna. But I didn't realize it. Um, originally, we we're just going to go in and talk about the manna in John chapter 6, but what you have here in the Word of God is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. Uh, this is, again, one of the most important chapters in all the Bible, bear, uh, no matter where you read in the Bible. Now, we'll discover that this evening as we study the Word of God. Say, this is a monumental chapter in the Word of God, and we'll just hit the highlights and um, then pick it up again 
uh, uh, next week. Now, here in uh, John, uh, John chapter uh, 6, what I want to look at uh, this evening, there are four questions that the people ask the Lord Jesus Christ. There are four questions we have here, and you can mark them in your uh, Bible. And then uh, the word believe, just in this section, is used about nine times. And then the word verily, verily, I say unto you. Uh, that's used about four times. So there's a lot of circling you can do uh, in this passage in the Word of God and uh, to really get into the Word of God. Now, in verses 22 through 24, we find here that the crowd follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, this is the crowd that saw the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 men. Now, uh, as many have brought out, so you have 5,000 men plus women and children, and uh, most uh, people would estimate, uh, estimate, that, uh, estimate that there's probably about 20,000 people there at the feeding of the 5,000. Say, uh, 5,000 men plus the women, and say they had a couple of children, and uh, bring the children along. And so what you have here is a tremendous amount of people. Now, uh, at least uh, 15,000, maybe 20,000 people that were miraculously fed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, the context here is the next day, Jesus goes over the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And so we find that a great number of that crowd, say 15, 20,000, whatever it may have been, uh, follows the Lord Jesus Christ. See, they, uh, this is a time of popularity in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he is at a pinnacle of popularity. See, uh, and so you have thousands of people that are following him. Now, um, as uh, you read the context here, see, there are two reasons why these uh, many, many thousands of people followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, one reason was very clearly brought out here in the Word of God is that they wanted more bread. They wanted more miraculous fish and bread. See, and that's what they were coming for. Now, if he fed us yesterday and he performed such a uh, tremendous miracle, we want him to perform another miracle. So they are seeking the Lord Jesus Christ because of bread. And number two, as you read the Word of God, and in the context here, is that they wanted to make him to be king. And he's uh, uh, the king of Israel, so that he'd put down the Roman, uh, the Roman oppression uh, to the Jews. Now, see, these are the two reasons why they are following the Lord Jesus Christ. See, number one, they want more food. They want to experience another miracle as they had just uh, uh, experienced. Now, and number two uh, was they want to make him king. So number one, for their own needs. And what you see there uh, in the Word of God, when you give people something, uh, they want more, and that builds a, a, a following if you give people uh, food, and that's exactly what uh, Jesus did here. But now, the other thing is, see, they are following Jesus because of political reasons. Now, they want him to be their king. Now, they want uh, him to feed them, and number two, politically, uh, he would be their king, he would put down the Roman rule, and they would... Um, have freedom from the Roman uh, oppression. Now, uh, the first question they ask is verse 25. Now, see, when they meet up and they find uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and when they had found him, see, they found now the Lord Jesus Christ, see, and uh, on the other side of the sea, see, and they went in boats, some of them walked, some of them went in, in boats, and they uh, maneuvered around, to get in Capernaum where the Lord Jesus was. And they said unto him, see, now this is the first question they ask, Rabbi, uh, whence camest thou, uh, uh, when 
comest thou hither? In other words, when did you come here? In other words, why did you leave the other side? When did you come here? Uh, and uh, how, uh, that type of a thing. You know, why, why are you here uh, now? This is very interesting because uh, Jesus did not answer that question at all. He didn't, he didn't even entertain an answer to that question when they said, when did you come here? You see, and uh, he, he didn't uh, answer uh, that, that question. But um, we find out the real reason why they came See, they wanted more uh, food, miraculous feeding, and they wanted to make him the king over the nation of uh, Israel. Now, uh, in verse uh, 26, Jesus answered. Now, here's the answer he gave when they said, when did you come here? Uh, Jesus answered them and said, verse 26, verily, verily. Now, see, this is why what we will uh, study tonight, we'll never get through it, but this is literally one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. Heaven and hell, heaven or hell, depends upon this chapter in the Word of God as we develop it uh, and see. So he says here, verily, verily, verse 26, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles. Now, in other words, see, the miracles, plural, not only the feeding of 5,000, but the others and what Jesus is saying here, that those miracles made no impression upon you whatsoever. In other words, uh, your emphasis was on the miracles and not on the person who performed the miracle, see? And they just wanted more, more food. Now, now, as you study the Word of God, see, all the miracles that Jesus Christ performed in the Gospels were uh, never designed to draw attention to the miracle, but to draw attention to the one who performed the miracle that they might realize he's the Messiah of Israel and he is the Savior of the world. Now, most of the people, just like here, say they just saw the miracle, made no spiritual impression upon them whatsoever. They, they didn't uh, in any way uh, get a hold of Jesus and who he was and why he came and so forth. So he said, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles or what he's talking about here. See, the, the purpose behind the miracle, see, or the uh, person even behind the miracles. But he says, but because, see, now here's why they're coming after Jesus, because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. In other words, see, you are coming to me and following me, now the other side of the Sea of Galilee, because you want to see another miracle or you want more food. Now, um, and then Jesus said in verse 27, a very, very uh, clear uh, statement, you see, and now, see, like as we study the woman at the well, uh, Nicodemus, all, all these passages in the Gospels, what you find is that, see, people uh, initially look at things from a physical, uh, material, temporal standpoint. And Jesus has to really zero in that it's not the physical that is important. It's not the material uh, things in life, but the spiritual. See, that's what I'm trying uh, to communicate to you is not physical, but spiritual. Now, he says in verse 27, see, labor not for the meat or the food that perishes. In other words, don't be concerned about the food that uh, you ate at the previous uh, miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 men. And then he says, uh, but for that uh, food which endureth, see, unto everlasting life. Now, see, again, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, uh, over and over again, see, what Jesus clearly is doing, get your eyes off the temporal. Get your eyes off the material things and get your eyes on the spiritual. In other words, I came to give everlasting life. I didn't come to feed people. I didn't come simply to perform those miracles, but behind everything is uh, the spiritual. I came to give everlasting life. Now, he says, um, which endureth on everlasting life, verse 27, which the Son of Man 
shall give unto you. Now, now right away, he hits him over the head, uh, you might say, with a sledgehammer, a hammer, see? And he says, see, I can give you everlasting life. See, now they're out for the food. They saw the miracle. They had no spiritual association with the miracle. And he's trying to wake them up and so forth. So he says, uh, which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. See, now he's making a tremendous statement here. I am the one that can give to you everlasting life. Now, I'm sure they were all floored. And they said, what in the world is he talking about? Here, we're coming to see another miracle. We want more food. We want more miracle uh, food. And here, he's talking about giving us everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now, and then he gets into the matter of God the Father and has sealed him in the sense that, see, I have God's divine approval upon my life. See, I, and that is why I can give everlasting life because I have the approval of God Almighty, you see, uh, in uh, my, uh, my life. So uh, we see that very, uh, very clearly. Now, in verse 28, you have the second question. See, the first question is back in verse uh, 20, uh, uh, 27. Now, the second question is verse 28, that they ask him. And uh, they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now, that is a very, very difficult verse to interpret in the Bible. Now, Jesus is talking to them about now, in the previous verse, everlasting life. I can give you everlasting life. I'm not talking about food and uh, feeding you, but I'm talking to you about everlasting life. And um, so they say here in verse uh, 28, you see, what shall we do that we might do the works of God? Now, that's a very difficult verse to uh, interpret. Now, uh, most everybody says, well, they're simply asking, uh, Jesus, what should we do in order to please God? And uh, that's the common interpretation of that verse, but I don't think that's what it's talking about at all, because I don't think at this point, as we'll read on in a moment, they're not ready to please God. They're not interested in uh, pleasing God uh, at all. And number two, sometimes people use that verse in relation to uh, salvation. Well, um, they're certainly not asking how to be saved. See, we'll read on, and that, that's way out of the context. They have no uh, desire for salvation, didn't understand anything about it, and uh, so forth. So uh, they're not asking about uh, salvation, but I believe what they're talking about here is what do we need to do so that we can get you to do what we want you to do. See, in other words, see, how can we manipulate you to do what we want you to do? Now, that seems to be what they're talking about. Or um, they could be saying, we don't know, they, they could be talking about like, uh, well, uh, see, you, you fed the, the 5,000 men. Now, what do we need to do in order to perform miracles like you? So whatever is being said here is, uh, uh, it's not uh, exactly cl clear. See, in verse 29, this is the work of God, or uh, verse 28, what shall we do that we might do the works of God? Now, the answer that Jesus Christ gave is very, very clear. It's very, very obvious what he told them. Now, no matter what they were asking him, no matter how you look at that second question, about what they were uh, uh, asking uh, uh, him, you see, the answer is found there in verse 29. The, and Jesus answered, see the question, and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath uh, uh, sent. So now, whatever they were asking, Jesus says very, very clearly, See, the most important thing that you need in your life 
is salvation. Just like you said in the uh, previous verse, uh, two verses before. Now, you see, uh, and the, the main thing you need in your life is salvation. And I believe that's what uh, he's talking about uh, here uh, in, in the Word of God. Now, it says here in verse 29, this is the work of God that ye believe on him, uh, on him whom he hath uh, uh, sent. Now, uh, here we get into uh, the chapter, and as we develop it, see, uh, the word believe is used nine times here in uh, uh, the Word of God. See, over and over again in this passage alone, from this verse on to the end, uh, it's used nine times the word believe. See, and um, actually the word believe is used 98 times in the Gospel of John. 98 times in the Gospel of John, and it's used eight times from this verse on in uh, the Word of God. Now, you see, uh, this helps us to understand, you see, um, what Bible salvation is all about. Now, a lot of people uh, say that the Gospel of John uses the word believe 98 times in the Gospel of John, and so, therefore, the Gospel of John just teaches easy believism. Now, see, that is not true at all, and it shows that somebody has not studied uh, the Gospel uh, of John. Because, see, this chapter helps us to understand what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, later on in the chapter, Jesus will tell us and teach us exactly what it means to believe in uh, uh, the Lord Jesus uh, uh, Christ. And it helps us to understand that. Now, see, the word believe in the Gospel of John is many times used of a, a shallow belief that has nothing to do with salvation. See, someone might say, well, every time the word believe is used in the Gospel, it's talking about salvation. No, it's not. Say many times, say actually what you have in the Gospel of John, see, is a contrast between true believing in Jesus Christ and those who do not truly believe in Jesus Christ. Now, to illustrate that, turn to John chapter uh, 2 once again. Uh, we covered it, but, um, but uh, we find here in John chapter 2 and verse 25. See, and when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, see, many believed in his name. Now, it says many believed in his name. That has nothing to do with salvation. They were not saved. Uh, they uh, believed in him. See, the Bible says um, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Now, again, you read on, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. The word commit in uh, John chapter 2 and verse 24, is the same as the word believe. In other words, they believed in Jesus, Jesus did not believe in them. Now, what uh, the, bio, uh, the book of John teaches very clearly, say you can believe in Jesus Christ, but you see, it, it may not be a true, valid, salvation belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in other words, say the people believed in him, when they saw the miracles, just like these people here that he's talking to right now. See, uh, they believed in him. See, they believed he performed that miracle. They went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they chased after him. They said, we want to make you a king, the king of Israel, uh, and uh, uh, we want you to perform another miracle, and we want you uh, to feed us. Now, you see, uh, they believed in Jesus but they were not saved. See, and what Jesus is saying, you need to believe in the salvation sense of that word. That's the most important thing that you need in your life is to be saved. In other words, uh, forget about these miracles. What you really need is salvation, Bible uh, salvation. Now, when we come to the end of the chapter, and we'll not get into that this evening, but when you come to the end of uh, chapter 6, they understood, and he explained very, very carefully 
what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. See, what it means to believe in Him. Has nothing to do with His miracles. Has nothing to do with the fact that they want to make Him king. See, has nothing to do with anything like that. It doesn't mean that you believe He's genuine. And they believed he was genuine, that he really performed the miracle. They saw the miracle. They didn't question the miracle. They knew he performed uh, uh, the miracle. So they believed in him in that sense, but they were not saved and they did not get saved. Now, when you come to the end of the chapter, after he explains exactly what it means to believe in him, they all left him, except the 12. They all left him. He lost the crowd. In other words, those, uh, if there were 15, 20,000, no matter how many followed him, say 5,000, 10,000 out of that crowd, they followed him. Say they all left him at the end of the chapter when he explained to them what it means to really believe in him to uh, be saved. Now, in verse 30, we have the third question now that they ask. And they said, therefore, unto him. Uh, now, you see, their, their wheels are turning a little bit. Now, see, they still did not get hold of Bible salvation that Jesus is, wants to zero in on being saved, knowing the Lord, that type of thing. Um, a belief in that sense. Now, in verse 30, they said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? Uh, what dost thou work? In other words, what miracle are you going to perform? Now, but you talk about the blindness and the darkness that people have in relation to spiritual matters. Now, someone might say, if I was there and I saw the miraculous feeding of 15,000 uh, people, I would have known that he's the Son of God, that he's the Messiah of the nation of Israel. He is the Savior of the world. Now, and what do they say? They say, now you show us a sign to really prove who you are and that you came uh, from uh, heaven. Imagine that. See, now they already saw uh, a tremendous sign. <laughs> I mean, feeding, and, and they realized he fed uh, 15,000 people miraculously, but it, nothing, nothing spiritual registered in their mind. They, 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 they saw him, they heard him, and not one ounce of spirituality, um, you see, registered in their mind. So now this is the third question. They said, what sign showest thou then that we may see and uh, uh, believe thee? Uh, what doest thou? And then they said, uh, they said, now, you see, they, they still have no spiritual insight into Jesus Christ, spiritually. Now, they, they know he previously did that miracle, and they're here to get more food, and they actually want him to be the king, see, they believe in him in a political sense and a materialistic sense and so forth. And um, they say in verse 31, you see, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. Now, see, that's where the springboard, where we're getting into this chapter. Uh, see, that's what we're studying. See, the manna in the wilderness, God miraculously feeding the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness with the manna. Now, they said... In verse 31, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. Now, see, they could even quote the Bible. See, they said it's written right in the Bible. See, and what they're saying, say, we believe the Bible. We believe the Word of God. Now, now again, they are totally in spiritual darkness. They have no indication about Bible salvation. Our fathers did eat manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they quote the Old Testament. And they quote a verse from the Old Testament. And it's there in the Psalms where it says he gave bread from heaven to eat. And so, see, uh, what they said. Now, this is about the, the manna there in uh, uh, the wilderness. And, um, and he gave them bread from heaven 
uh, to eat. Now, see, uh, what they're saying is, you see, God uh, miraculously provided that manna in the wilderness. Now, see, what they're saying is we know that that was a miracle from God. Now, see, they already personally eyeballed the feeding of the 15,000. They say, we want a sign from you. I mean, how dark, how, um, what, uh, what, how can we describe somebody that has an attitude like that, that they just saw a tremendous miracle, and they knew it was a miracle, and they say, we want another miracle uh, from you. That shows the blindness of their heart. Now, how did Jesus answer? And we see it in verse 32. We have answer uh, to this third question in verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, say again, verily, verily. In other words, sit up, take notice. This is very, very important what I am saying unto you. Really get a hold of what I'm saying. In verse 32, verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Now again, see, they made a common mistake. Uh, the Israelites in the Old Testament and these people, see, Moses did not give them the bread. In other words, don't look to Moses. Don't give the glory to Moses. The manna came from heaven. God miraculously supplied it. Don't think that Moses did it, but God did it. But uh, as you read here in verse uh, uh, 32, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but say, my father giveth you. See, it was the father, the God gave them the manna for those 30 years. Now, he says, uh, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. In other words, say, I am the true bread. Say, uh, you talk about a sign. I am the true bread from heaven. Now, and he says, verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down. See, now what he's saying, see that manna in a sense was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, but now he's saying he is, so to speak, the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. And in verse 33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven. Now, see, this is pretty heavy stuff. See, and by the way, people need to understand that. Who is Jesus Christ? A lot of people say, oh, I believe in Jesus, but they don't really believe in his deity. They don't believe he came from the Father, that he came from heaven into this uh, world. You see, uh, a lot of people have a shallow belief about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and he, and he says here, for the bread of God, verse 33, is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, say, now Jesus is saying, now you're talking about the physical bread, that manna in the Old Testament that we study about, and you know it. He says, you quoted it, you know the scripture. And by the way, here you see how Jesus is putting a seal of approval upon the Word of God and the Old Testament. See, he believed in the uh, passage that we read about in the book of Exodus about the manna coming from heaven. And he put his seal uh, upon the word of God that the Bible is the inspired uh, word of God. But he says, you see, now, um, he giveth life unto the world. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Say, uh, not physical life. See, Jesus is saying, I did not come to bring you food physically. See, that's not the, the reason why I came into this world. But you see, he says, life. See, what he says there in verse 33, life unto the world. Now, what he's talking about there, say spiritual life. See, you, you cannot have spiritual life apart from knowing the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, a lot of people know a lot about Jesus Christ. They want to make him king. They want to get involved in politics. Uh, they, they want him to feed them. Uh, they want him to uh, do a miracle. Uh, but you see, uh, all those things that people believe they were not saved. But now, see, Jesus says, I want to give you spiritual life. Say, not physical life. You see, I'm not here to feed the world. 
but I am here to give spiritual life unto the world. That should make everybody examine their heart. Do I have spiritual life? Or am I like these people? Well, man, I saw them feeding the 5,000. Man, I want more bread. I want more things from Jesus. I want Jesus to give me more things, you see, and I want more food. I want to experience more things along, along that line. So now in verse 34, you have the fourth question that the people ask in verse 34. And they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread that you are talking about. Now, as you look there in verse 34, how did they address Jesus in verse 34? How, according to the Bible? What did they call him? They called him Lord. Now, here's another indication in the Bible of a belief in Jesus Christ that does not save a soul. Now, I can believe he's a miracle worker, and we need to be very, very careful because I think we all know today anybody involved in the charismatic movement, a lot of these uh, faith healing movements, say the emphasis is on the healing. It's not on the Savior. It's not on salvation. Now, um, so they believed he fed the 15,000. Then they also believed that uh, they wanted him to be their king. They wanted to make him a king at this time. And uh, I'm sure what they're saying is, man, here, we got 15,000 people that'll vote you in right now. We'll rebel against Rome and let you take over. And then you will uh, take care of the political uh, situation of the day. Now, and then they referred to him as Lord, and they weren't saved. They had no, they didn't have, at this time, they did not have a clue of what Bible salvation is all about. They didn't have a clue about what Bible salvation is all about. Now, and yet, they called Lord. They say, well, uh, Pastor, if they called him Lord, they must have been saved. No, they were not saved. It's very obvious. See, again, get ahead of ourselves. You come to the end of the chapter, they all turn away from him. When he really tells them what it means to believe in Jesus, they all uh, went away, every one of them. He lost the crowd. He lost thousands of people as a result of this sermon. That's why this is one of the most important passages, chapters in all of the Word uh, of God. Now, that reminds us, see, someone might say, well, pastor, if somebody calls Jesus Lord, they must be saved. No, they were not saved. It's very clear in John chapter 6 that they were not saved. Now, that reminds us of the famous passage that we've heard a million times. Amen? Matthew 7 and verse 21. Now, you see how you fit the Bible together when you study the Bible, when you get into the Word of God? We've all heard this how many times? Thousands, thousands of times. We've heard it a million times. See, Matthew 7, 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. You see what the Bible says here. And Jesus is talking about the great judgment day. Not everyone that say, uh, saith, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says with famous passage, we don't have to read it. You know it. You've heard it many, many times. And yet uh, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. They are not saved. And yet they referred to Jesus as Lord. Say, these people, there's an illustration of it, John chapter 6. They say, Lord. They didn't know him as their Lord and Savior. They were, they were just using that as a, a, a way of referring to him, but no real true meaning behind it. Now, he says, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now, certainly these people, John chapter 6, were not doing the will of the Father. But then, you see, in verse 22, now, Jesus repeats himself. He says, many, not some, but many people 
and the great judgment day, you see, in verse 22, will say unto me in that day, the judgment day, Lord, Lord. They address him as Lord, and yet they were never, ever saved. See, so now a person can see a miracle, feeding of 15,000, want to make Jesus their king, and actually refer to Jesus Christ as Lord and still not be saved. See, a lot of people have a lot of good words about Jesus, but they're not saved. Now, Matthew 7, 22, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not uh, cast out devils in thy name, done many wonderful works in thy name? And Jesus will uh, profess unto them, say, I never knew you. Now, you call me Lord, Lord. Even at the judgment day, we'll call Jesus Christ Lord. And they'll be cast into hell. Why? Because they were never saved. They never did the will of God. The first thing in God's will is salvation. They never came to know Jesus Christ as their uh, Savior. Well, we could spend a lot of time on that. But now as we get back to the fourth question in verse 34, the answer. Uh, they said unto him, Lord, say, and yet they're still in spiritual darkness. They still are not saved. And they say, Lord. They refer to him as Lord. Evermore give us this bread. Now, and they say, uh, they said to Jesus, now you give us this bread that we're talking about. Now, remember, uh, basically, we're coming to get more food. We want miraculous bread and, and uh, fish. See, we want a good dinner from you. And um, so now, in uh, verse uh, 34, they say unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Now, in verse 35, Jesus made one of the great statements in all the Word of God. And see, here's where you have one of those I am's in the Gospel of John. By the way, there are many, many incidences in the Gospel of John where we have the I am declarations of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, like we saw Sunday morning, see, Jesus said to the woman of the well, I am. See, he, in your King James Bible, is in italics. See, it's not there. He simply said, I am. See, that's a divine name for God. Everybody knew that that was a name for Jehovah God in the Old Testament. And besides the seven I am's that are very familiar, in the Gospel of John, you have about 15 times in the Gospel of John that Jesus uses that term, I am. See, and that's the Old Testament equivalent for Jehovah God. That's the way God revealed himself to Moses. But here in verse 35, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. I'm not here to give you a loaf of bread. I am the bread of life. You see, verse 35, he that cometh to me. Now, in other words, say, you need to come to me in a spiritual sense. Say, you need to come to me, and he says, shall never hunger. In other words, say, your spiritual um, satisfaction will be met. Say, uh, you will be satisfied spiritually. Now, uh, that's what Jesus claims, that you will never, uh, see, he says, hunger. In other words, I will satisfy you. What happens when a person gets saved? Jesus Christ satisfies them. He gives them satisfaction that they can never get in any other way, and they can never get it in the world. So he says, and um, they shall never hunger, and he that believeth, say, on me shall never thirst. And a great illustration of that is Sunday morning. Because the woman at the well, we're not through with her yet, uh, we'll spend a lot more time there in John chapter 4. But see, what, she, what did she do with the water pot? John chapter 4, the woman at the well. She left it at the well. She ran into town 
to be a witness for Christ. See, her thirst was quenched. Now, and uh, she was involved in all types of uh, sexual sin, sexual perversion, and can't get around it. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about there. But see, uh, she came there on a hot day to get a drink of cool water. And man, she got her thirst quenched, but her spiritual thirst was quenched. And she left that water pot and she ran into the town. Now, he says, believeth on me shall never uh, thirst. But I say unto you that ye also have seen me. And see, here's a clear statement in the Gospel of John. And you don't believe in me. See, now we're learning a, a little bit about what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. See, and he actually says to them, you do not believe in me. Now, what do you mean? We believe in your miracles. We want you to be king. We refer to you as Lord. And yet Jesus says, you don't believe in me. See, see they never had uh, up until this point, and this is just the introduction, they never had a salvation belief in Jesus Christ. See, being saved doesn't mean I believe that he can perform miracles. See, being saved does not mean I believe that he needs to be our political leader. See, it has nothing to do with salvation. Uh, or uh, I even call him Lord. It has nothing to do with salvation. See, and he says, you don't believe in me. You're truly not born again. You've never been saved. Now, he says in verse 37, all that the Father giveth to me shall come to me. Now, he said, in other words, if you're of the Father, you would come to me for salvation. Now, it says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Now, uh, who are those that the Father gives to Jesus Christ? Now, uh, the ones that he gives to Jesus Christ are those who come to him in repentance and faith. They are the ones that the Father gives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, see, now, if you don't have a desire to come to me, you're not of the Father. See, if you don't have that desire to come to me, because, see, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. See, and uh, so uh, you're not uh, dealing uh, in a positive way with the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God even in your life. And he says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, you come to Jesus, he'll never refuse you. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, no matter who, who you are, if you're Nicodemus and a nice religious person, or you're the woman at the well, no matter who you are, rich or poor, you come to Jesus, he'll never cast you out. Anybody that wants to come to him for salvation can come and he will save them. And at the end of the chapter, they all walked away from Jesus Christ. Not one of them wanted to be saved. Not one of them got saved. He lost the crowd. You see, not one of them got saved. So um, he says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And that word no wise is a double negative. See, he will never cast anybody out. You come to him, you're his. You have security in him. You have safety in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ when you come to him. By the way, that's a great verse on the security of the believer. He will never cast you out. See, it's a double negative. Never under any circumstances, no matter what you do, you will always be his children, his child, if you come in repentance and faith. Now, look at verse 38. Now, there are three things Jesus says here. The unique claims of Jesus Christ. Now, all of this is a requirement for salvation. See, he, he, he's talking to him about being saved now. And he says in verse 38, I came down from heaven. Now, wait a minute. That's pretty heavy stuff. He came down from heaven. See, he's a divine son of God. That's a unique claim of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where did he come from? He came from heaven, just like the man who came from heaven. He came from uh, heaven. And then in verse 39, he says, and this is uh, the father 
the Father's will which sent me, that all which he hath given to me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And so now he claims to have resurrection power. He has the power to raise people, everybody in the last day, in the judgment day. He has the power to raise everybody from the dead. That's a pretty hefty claim. Amen? Say so that he will raise the dead. And uh, he says the same thing last part of verse 40. And then, uh, see, in verse 40, he said, say, he is the only one who can give you everlasting life. No priest can give it to you. No church can give it to you. No pastor can give it to you. Uh, no baptismal tank can give it to you. No church can give it to you. See what he says in verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son, and you have certainly saw him uh, literally, and believeth on him. Now, again, you have the word believe. See, I came from heaven. I will raise the dead. See, it's not some easy believism uh, that presents a shallow Jesus. But he says, believeth on him may have everlasting life. Now, he says, uh, if you believe in me, I will give you everlasting life. Heaven will be your home. The only way you can ever get to heaven is through me. And he says, I'll raise him up uh, in the last days. Well, uh, our time is gone. But now, next Wednesday night, we'll pick it up in verse 41 through the end of the chapter, verse 71, 41 through 71. And it explains why they rejected him and why they never got saved. This explains why they never got saved and why the biggest crowd that he ever had, every one of them left him. Every one of them turned their back. And that's why this is a powerful chapter. We don't have time to get into it. And you'll see why every one of those thousands of people that followed him, See, for food, want to make him king. Even told, said that he was Lord. See, why, why they'll turn away from him. They'll never be saved uh, because he explained to them what it really means to be saved and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John chapter 6 and verses 41 through 71. That's your homework for tonight, for next Wednesday night, because that passage misinterpreted by the Roman Catholic Church and others has sent more people to hell than any other passage in the Bible. Misinterpreted by the Roman Catholic Church and a lot of Protestant churches as well. See, um, has caused millions and millions and millions of people to go to hell. That's why I said, see, this is one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. You study it out, see what it's saying there, and it'll help us to understand, number one, what it really means to believe in Jesus Christ, and number two, it'll help us to debunk the Roman Catholic theory, see, of their mass and cannibalism and eating the literal body and drinking the blood of Jesus Christ. So that passage in the Bible is responsible, misinterpreted to send millions of people to hell. We'll deal with it, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries, Lord doesn't come back uh, next week. See, and um, from verses 41 through 71, put it all together and explains it and puts it together so we know exactly what Jesus is talking about so we can understand what he is talking about. This is a marvelous chapter in the Word of God. Amen? It's a tremendous chapter in the Word of God. But now tonight, do you have everlasting life? Now, you say, oh yes, I have everlasting life. Well, uh, does that simply mean you believe Jesus is a good guy? 
He actually can perform miracles. He's, uh, uh, he fed 5,000 men, plus the women and children. You say, I, I'd like to vote for Jesus Christ so he could be the president of the United States. Well, that's not Bible salvation. You say, I call him Lord. But have you ever truly repented of your sin and really trusted him as your savior? See, do you know him as a personality? Are you infatuated with him? Do you know about him or have you really, truly been saved? We mentioned Sunday night, Revelation 1.5. See, and washed us in his, from our sins in his own blood. That's Revelation 1.5. Now, see, that's the aorist tense. And what that simply means, salvation is not a process. It's a once for all decision and commitment that I make to Jesus Christ. It's not a process. It's a decision that I make for the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, have you made that decision? Can you say, I know I have. Uh, well, he's a good guy. He's a miracle worker. Uh, he'd make a good politician. Uh, I call him Lord, but have you been saved? Can you say, I know there's a time in my life when I invited him in and I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Let's bow in prayer. As our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed, I wonder if there's someone uh, here tonight. Now, say we didn't get into a lot of detail about it, but we're getting closer to what it really means to believe in Jesus. And you say, Pastor, I believed in Jesus all my life, but I realize tonight that I need to personally invite him into my life. I just don't look upon him as a personality, as a religious leader. But I realize tonight he's the Savior of the world, and I need to invite him. I want that everlasting life. I want to know when I die, I'll go to heaven. Pastor, pray for me. Pray that I'll get saved. Pray that I would truly be saved. And you raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Pastor, that's me. I want to be saved. I want to get it settled once and for all. Or you just look into Jesus for bread. You just want what you can get out of Jesus. You, you want him to uh, be your co-pilot. He doesn't want to be the co-pilot. He wants to be the pilot. He wants to be your Lord and Savior. Anyone, I'm not saved, but pastor, I realize tonight I need to be saved. Our Father, we pray that you might speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us as we study the Word of God. What a powerful passage in the Word of God. Lord, we must say that John chapter 6 is one of the most important chapters in all of the Word of God. Help us to be edified by it. Help us to study it out as we, Lord, tarries as we come together next Wednesday evening. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's